Okay, so we are going to work on our next type called complex ions. They sound complex, <laughs> uh, get it, but they're really actually one of the easiest ones to identify, and once you figure out that it's a complex ion, you're going to have your best options. Um, so, complex ions, what they are made up of, they are made up of a metal, and what we call a ligand. A ligand's kind of an attachment, and every single metal, based on its characteristics, characteristics can attach different numbers of ligands, different amounts, depending upon the, the, the room in their valence shell. Now, this topic is actually going to be removed from the AP in the next few years. We're getting a redesign because we're so superficially covering this. There is an entire graduate school class just on these organometallic type things. So I'm just superficially covering things. I'm only giving you the bare minimum to get through the few AP problems that might show up. One of these showed up on last year's AP. In my opinion, it probably means it's not going to show up in one of the three on this year's. But you never know. Okay? So we're going to do what we need to do to know it and do the AP reactions. It doesn't show up anywhere else usually on the AP. Um, well, I lie. Sometimes in some lab questions it'll show up, but you'll be able to handle it. So, possible metals. Any transition metal can make a complex ion. However, there are some favorites that often show up, and I call these the fish metals. Now, I'm kind of tethered to this microphone right now, and I can't get to it. So, you all need to look at that periodic table over there. And you got to use your imagination. Think out of the box. Everyone find cadmium, okay? And silver and copper and zinc. You see how that makes the square? Copper, zinc, silver, and cadmium. And then look at aluminum. Do you see how the aluminum kind of attaches to the square and it looks like a diving fish? Yeah, really try really hard. Where, where silver's the nose of the fish and aluminum is the, the tail. Okay, so I call those the fish metals. So the fish metals are A, G, C, U, C, D, zinc, and aluminum. Okay, these are the most common transition metals they use on the AP. Um, however, I repeat, any transition metal can do this. Things that they'll attach to. If you hear in excess or they give you a super, super, super duper high molarity, like 18 molar, blah, blah, blah. Those are your keys that we're dealing with high molarities, that you're dealing with a complex ion problem. What happens? Super high molarity stuff will attack a comp um, one of those transition metals and just surround it like a cage, OK? Um, what we most often see surrounding these, the two ligands that are most popular, are NH3, and we actually call that the amine ligand, and OH minus, called the hydroxy ligand. Okay, the amine and the hydroxy ligands. However, they can also give you an excess, things like SCN minus, so that's the thiocyano. And sometimes they give you the CN minus, which is just the cyano. There's things like that in combination with a fish metal or any transition metal are indicators that you have one of these types of problems. Again, how do we know? Fish metal or transition metal, and you see in excess or things with super high molarities. That's the key. Okay? Now, how many ligands do we attach to these metals? Well, there's something I call the magic number. The magic number tells you how many ligands attached. All right, so let's talk about the fish metals. The nose of the fish, which is who? Silver can attach two ligands to it. So if it's silver, only two ligands jump on it, okay? The rest of the fish, its magic number is four, so we can hold four ligands. 
Now, what about metals that are not fish metals? When in doubt, for all other metals, attach double the, oxi the most common oxidation state. So attach double most common oxidation number of ligands. Okay, so let's look at nickel, for instance. That showed up last year. I think it was nickel. Um, so what's nickel's most common oxidation state? At stand fell, so what's its common oxidation state? Two. Nickel can be two or three. It's not an Asten fell, so two. So we double that. We can attach four ligands to nickel. Okay. What about gold? Double that. Two ligands. What about iron? Six ligands. Okay. So that's how you use the magic number. So don't let all this scare you. Okay. Um, Note that they're naming in these notes, I didn't write these notes, they're naming it hydroxo, I call it hydroxy, and both are acceptable, okay? Let me go to working problems before you freak this. Let's just skip to the next. I'll fill in the rules in a second, but right now I just want to do this first one to show you how easy they are to recognize. Concentrated ammonia. Do you see how we have a, a high concentration of one of the ligands? And it's being mixed with a fish metal. That's how we know that this is a complex ion problem, okay? So we're adding 15 molar ammonia, NH3. It's a covalent compound, so we can't split it up. And what do we write? Is that nitrate going to be included since it's not in nitric acid? Nope. So copper plus two. Because this is so concentrated, it bombards and bombards and bombards. So how do we write? We write a bracket. We write copper, okay? Then we do another small bracket, a parenthesis, I mean. And what's the magic number for copper? It's in the fish, the fish metal. So what would it be? Four. That means we put four ligands on it. Now the overall, this is a complex ion, so it's going to have a charge. The overall charge of this, you just figure out using rules. Does NH3 have a charge? No. Copper is plus two. So what would the charge of this be? There you go. Now, to balance this, we need four of those, and we're balanced. Got it? Okay, let's do this next one, a suspension. I'm skipping, I'm skipping this. I'm going to have to do rules before I do this one. So right now, let's just do a suspension of zinc hydroxide. What does it mean to be a suspension? It's as much as dissolved as dissolved, so it's... It's not, yeah, it's not soluble is what we say, but in actuality, some of it dissolves. It's almost like supersaturation. When you have a suspension, you just have also, in addition to some being dissolved, a lot of junk floating around in addition. So we're going to do a suspension, leave it solid. Okay? It's treated with concentrated. There's the word right here, concentrated. That's how you know it's going to need to be a fish metal problem, I mean a complex ion. This is the same as saying excess, okay? So, we already have zinc hydroxide, but when we bombard it, we, we make it complex. And in doing so, we now, is that a fish metal? Absolutely. And what is it gonna do? What's the magic number? Four, and then what do I put up top? This has a charge now. What now? Two minus, right? Okay, so what do I need to do to make this balance? Put a two there. It's not too bad, right? Okay, let's do the next one. Yeah, it could be much worse. Solid silver chloride, uh-oh. Is, is added to concentrated ammonia. How do we know? We've got co a concentrated ligand plus a fish metal. So we start out, and I forgot to name these, darn it, we got to go back. So we have silver, all right, and what do, how, many, how many ligands do we have on silver? Nose of the fish, magic number's two, and so the overall charge here is plus one. Um, but I'm missing something to make this balance. I need a CL minus. So what happens is 
This pops onto here, dissolving the, the, dissolving the solid, leaving us with this floating around. And that takes care of our charge problem. And then we need a two there to make that balance. Got it? Thumbs up. All right, so what I want to do is tell you how to name these because you're going to be working backwards. It's so easy. You start out with your ligand. How many do we have? Four of them, right? What was four in covalent nomenclature? Tetra. And what's the name of the ligand? Amine. And you'll never have to write the name of them. You'll have to recognize the name of them. You'll never have to outright write the name. And then copper. And what's the charge of that copper? Copper 2. That's the name of that ion. Tetraamine copper 2 ion. Yeah, it is in the next one. Um, and that ion, like here, see how it's attached to a sulfate? It is now just an ion that can just bond and attach to pretty much anything. Are we going to do problems where that happens? Yes. We're going to do problems where if we have a chloride and a, and a silver floating around, you can make silver chloride. And we'll get there. That's on the last one. Okay. Um, you're not going to do problems with these complex ions. You're going to do um, AP equations with them. And then on occasion, they'll ask you a color. And you'll learn that the color of complex ions, like this, is the same color as the Cu plus 2, but it's much deeper and darker. They're deeper and darker colors. Exact same colors, but have more oomph to them. So we'll get to that throughout the year. OK. Um, oh, the rules. Oh, let's name this one real quick. This is zinc, but we're starting with our um, complex ion. Tetra hydroxy. And you can say hydroxo as well. Tetra, but again, you never have to name them. Just recognize them. Zinc ion. How come I don't need the two? There's, it's only univalent, so we don't need the two. All right, so when you're writing um, complex ions, you need to remember the following thing. Acids bust them up. Acids bust them up. When you add an acid plus a complex ion that has NH3, the H plus is going to pop on, and you're going to make NH4 plus plus whatever's left of the complex. Okay? So you guys are smart. If I add an acid to a complex with OH minus, What do we make? Water plus whatever's left. So when you see a problem where you're given the full name, they're always going to give you an acid with it, and they're wanting you to break it up. Prime example is this one right here. Okay. So hydrochloric acid, what do I write? H plus plus Cl minus, right, is added to a solution. Because this says solution, a tetraamine copper 2 is going to be separated from the sulfate. So let's write the tetraamine copper 2 ion. So it's copper. What do I write? NH, come on, 3, 4, and it's plus 2 plus the sulfate. We need that, okay? Because what's going to happen now, remember, Whenever you see the full name, you should just be thinking, I'm breaking this up, I'm breaking this up. It's really super easy to recognize. It's my favorite because you know immediately what it is. So this H plus is going to hop onto there. Okay, and what is it going to make? An H3. Okay, so now, oh, shoot, sorry. Yeah, I knew that. I actually knew that. An H4 plus, okay. So now what do we have floating around? What happened to the copper? Now the copper's like, I'm free, and the copper too. Now, the question you ask, will the copper too create a precipitate with SO4? So, sulfates. All sulfates are soluble except for sole can bag hags pretty badly. So no. Copper sulfate soluble. Will the copper go with the chloride to make an insoluble solid? No. That's soluble too. So we don't need these guys. 
So now we do need to make this balance, and it looks to me like it's balanced. No, we need way more of these. Do we need four of those? Four of those. 4-H pluses over here. And is that balanced? I'm trusting y'all. I'm not even thinking. I'm just writing. Like I'm in that zone where I'm not paying attention at all. Is it balanced? Okay. I'm trusting you. Yeah, I need Virage or, or Virage 2.0 confirmation. Okay. I thought I had more room for this problem than I do, so I'm going to kind of write it in red over here. Oh, I can fit it. Hydrochloric acid, what do I write? H plus Cl minus is added to a solution of dihydroxy silver bromide. What do I write? In the brackets, dihydroxy. So what's the oxidation number of that? Oh, this is a problem. I meant to change this last year. So go ahead and erase this. We're going to say di, diamine. Yeah, the charges. Bromide will not hop on because it's um, a negatively charged ion. So um, diamine, diamine silver bromide. OK. And then what's the charge of this? Plus 1. And then the bromide comes off because it's a solution of. Okay, so what's going to happen? We have a full thing. Remember I said whenever you have the full complex ion, you're just trying to bust it up. So we're going to bust up by creating an H4+. Plus. All right, so now the silver's floating around. Woohoo! What's the silver going to do? Silver can do a couple things. It's going to make silver chloride. All, chlor all halogens are soluble except for Hal hates Aggies pretty badly. Aggies. Isn't bromine a halogen too? So what else? Silver bromide. Okay. And do we need what we used everything? So two, two of the complexes? Yeah, we do. Is this going to balance since I changed the problem? This is going to be embarrassing. Okay. 4H pluses. Okay, so that does end up balancing. Why did it disappear? There it goes. Okay, so any questions on that? So that's complex ions. Let's move on quickly to decomposition reactions. These are the easiest to, well, I shouldn't say. Complex ions, I think, are the easiest to recognize. But what would make a decomposition reaction easy to see when you read the problem? It's one reactant. That's it. OK? So let me give you a couple common ones. And my generic rule of decomposing that polyatomics will decompose to gases is actually applying to every single thing I'm writing down here. So metallic carbonates, what do those decompose to? CO2 plus what's left is a metallic oxide. So we never just make a pure metal at this point. We're making a metallic oxide when that CO2 leaves. What about metallic chlorates? What do you think it makes? No, chlor, not we're going to make O2. If O2 were to come off a of chlorate, what's left? Yep, metal chloride, metallic chloride. Very good. Whoever said that? My back's turned. Who said that? Good job. Um, then we have the most famous of all decomposition reactions. You have H2O2 in your house underneath your sink. It goes bad after a while. What are we making? Water and oxygen. Not H2. We're not making hydrogen bombs underneath your sinks. Okay. And then let's see if you could figure this one out. I bet you you can. Based on our rule of polyatomics decomposing to gases, what two gases can you immediately come that can come off? 
ammonia and and then this one yeah some water comes off too yeah we can balance it I just I'm just showing you products right now what is it balanced we need a four then we need a two there one there okay um, then you already know these because you already studied them Hello? Unstable stuff, remember, from double replacement? What does this make? So most of this is not new, and that's kind of nice. Okay, so let's do the problems now. Yeah, so solution of hydrogen peroxide is heated. Really? What do we make? And it was 221. All right. Okay. When, if you want to look really smart and fancy, heated, you can put a triangle over the arrow. Oh, magnesium carbonate is heated. Okay, and these are all decomposition. We're heating them. Now, I've noticed a lot of students trying to make ions. Where's water? Nowhere. So don't be like trying to split things up like Oh, is magnesium oxide soluble? It doesn't matter because there's no water. So we have carbon dioxide gas coming off, and we're left with a metallic oxide. Okay, and then that's balanced. Potassium chlorate is heated. Okay, what? Mm -mm. Not ClO4. What was ClO4? Perchlorate is heated in the presence. Now, be careful, and I'm going to clarify this. When it says in the presence of, 90% of the time they're talking about something called a catalyst. You know what a catalyst is, right? It speeds up the reaction, lowers the activation energy, but it doesn't take part. So that's not in the reaction itself. Since it's heated, we're obviously decomposing this. And if you really have to write magnesium, manganese dioxide down, do it on the arrow, but you really don't have to write it at all. Okay? That decomposes. We make oxygen gas and a metal chloride, and then we need a common factor of six oxygen, so a two there, a three there, and a two there. And this one we already did. So these are really easy, guys. Are they what? Yeah, the problems are this straightforward for the most part. Where we get messed up is when we start mixing these up. And then you're like, oh my god, what is it? What kind is it? So what does this make? Decomposes to an H3, CO2, and water, and it's already balanced when that happens. Huh, muy bueno. So your homework is decomp and complex ions. Do y'all have any questions? We only have two more types. Woo! Yeah. So, it's actually not balanced, so let's go balance it. So, I'm going to say let's start with the two here. Somebody help out, guys. I'm not doing this by myself. Two there. Oh, that's what I did wrong. No, oh, that's what I did wrong. Okay, so the problem wasn't the balancing. It really does balance when you write the right reactants. Sorry, people ho at home. I actually do know kind of what I'm doing. Now it's probably going to balance if I put a 2 there. Does that do it? Are we sure? Yes. Okay. Now we're done 